Good morning, people of God. It is a joy to be with you this morning. It is a double holiday today. We are celebrating Memorial Day weekend, and also today is Pentecost, which is one of my favorite church holidays, and I think you'll hear a bit more about that as we go through the service this morning. We'll, we'll hear the story of Pentecost uh, in our scripture and sermon. Before we get into any of that, a few announcements. First, uh, you'll notice in your bulletin that we have a special uh, sort of thing happening this morning called Celebration of Discipleship. That's right after the scripture message anthem, then Celebration of Discipleship. There's an insert in your bulletin so that you can participate in that, and you'll hear more about that when the time comes. So just be aware of the insert in your bulletin that that goes along with that. If you're here in person, I think the, the text that you'll need will also be on the screen. Um, and if you're Zooming in from home, I, I think you'll probably have a copy of the bulletin in your email or um, in paper copy if you're someone who joins us regularly. Other announcements, uh, with the holiday weekend, the office will be closed on Monday. It'll also be closed Thursday and Friday this week due to annual conference. That's the, as the name implies, yearly gathering of representatives from United Methodist Churches throughout the upstate New York area that come together. We're all under the direction of one bishop and his cabinet, um, and we come together once a year to vote on matters that impact clergy and congregations in our area. So um, if you would just be mindful of the fact that Janine and I will both be out of the office as we'll be in Syracuse for that, and also just hold us all in prayer as we come into our annual conference um, this year. It's going to be a little bit different than it has been. We have a new bishop. It'll be the first year in several that we'll be physically in person together for conference. And uh, there'll be uh, quite a few churches that are uh, looking for approval to disaffiliate at conference this year. So a lot of new things that I hope you'll be praying about um, as Janine and I and some others are at conference this, this coming week. On the back of your bulletin, you'll notice that the Connect team is listed for this Friday, but due to our absence for conference, it'll actually be moved uh, to the following week, is my understanding. That's been coordinated through the office. Um, so if you're on Connect team, just I don't want confusion around that. Um, and if there are any other church-related things that need to be put on the calendar, just as always, please make sure those get communicated to Janine so that she can get them on the cal calendar. Another point of communication, we are back now to using the prayer book that we had been using before the pandemic began. It's that notebook on the back right there behind Kent. Um, it's, it's a, a, a three-ring binder style notebook where you can write down your prayer concerns and your joys, your joyful celebrations. Um, and that'll be a way for us to kind of streamline our community prayer time during the worship service. So if you haven't gotten a chance to write in it this morning and you'd like to, I'll leave it there for a little bit longer. I'll go um, collect it later in the service to, to use during our joys and concerns. I think that's it for announcements from my end. I'm gonna turn the microphone over. Uh, we have a couple of young gentlemen who are here to do some work for, uh, for ministry and whatnot who are looking for some support from our congregation. And so I've offered them a moment to come talk with us about that. Hello everyone, and thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Ethan, and this is Kenny, and we're college students from Nebraska, and it's really cool because we're up here for our summer internship where we will be selling educational children's books and Bible books to the community, and we're really excited because everyone's been super friendly, but the reason we're here today is because we stay with local host families while we're out here, and ours just kind of fell through, so we were wondering if anyone knew of someone who could point us in the right direction, or if anyone had a room we could rent out for the summer. And we work really long hours, so we're out of the house by before seven in the morning and back by nine o'clock at night, Monday through Saturday. So it's really just a place for us to sleep at night and to put our things. And we're also willing to pay rent, so this isn't an, op this isn't an opportunity for us to party. Uh, we're really just out here to build our professional skills, pay for college, and get new experiences. So any help would be awesome. Uh, and we'll be sitting right in the back 
of the service uh, when it gets over. So if you guys have any questions or can help out at all or just want to meet like a cool person from Nebraska, um, please come say hi. We'd love to meet all of you guys regardless. Thank you. Let us begin our worship together by joining in the responsive call to worship. Like the disciples, we gather in this space united by our relationship with the risen Christ. We come ready to receive what God has given. Just as tongues of fire descended on the disciples, we receive the gift of the Spirit's power and inspiration. Just as the resurrected Christ breathed the Spirit onto the disciples, As the life-saving and peacemaking Holy Spirit blazes through us today, we receive the gift of the Spirit's fire that unites us in the body of Christ. Amen. Would you stand as you're able to join in singing, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. And let us take a moment now to join our hearts in a prayer of confession. Almighty God, who sent the promised Holy Spirit to fill disciples with willing faith, 
We confess that we resist the work of your Spirit among us, that we are slow to serve you and reluctant to spread the good news of your love. God, have mercy on us. Forgive our divisions, and by your Spirit, draw us together. Create in us a desire to do your will and be your faithful people. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Beloved, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. I invite any children who wish to come forward and children at home to come close to the screens. I think it's just you and me, darling, for the in-person crowd. <laughs> you can sit wherever you're comfortable. All right, we have two holidays going at once. I bet you know at least one of them. What's, what's this holiday weekend? Memorial Day weekend, right. And the other one is a church holiday that I named once this morning. Do you remember? It's okay if you don't. Started with a P. That's good. Yep. That's okay. It's called Pentecost. Pentecost is not a holiday we hear much about because it's really very specifically a church holiday. Do you know anything about it? No, that's okay. I probably didn't either when I was here nine. Yeah, I probably didn't either when I was nine. So here's the thing with Pentecost. Pentecost, a lot of people call the birthday of the church, um, which is kind of an interesting way to think about it. But what, what really happened was that when Jesus died and was raised from the dead, it wasn't like all of a sudden the Christian church just started existing as we know it today. Right? So there were people who were like, whoa, this Jesus guy really came back from the dead. Like, we should we should gather together and celebrate that. And so the church started kind of forming in bits and pieces like that from people who recognized Jesus as the Messiah, the Savior, and who came together to study the ancient scriptures and, and to learn about who he was and to um, kind of try to figure out what all of that meant. Like it was a brand new thing that Jesus was raised from the dead. So they were trying to figure it all out. Well, one, Pente one Pentecost holiday, one day, when they were all gathered, the Holy Spirit came upon them. The Holy Spirit kind of shows up a lot of different times in the Bible in a lot of different ways. I'm trying to think of an analogy. Like, have you ever seen Frozen 2? Okay. You know in Frozen 2, that little sort of gecko creature that keeps showing up in different... Yes, the fire spirit. That's right. The fire spirit is a lot like the Holy Spirit that just kind of keeps showing up in different places in different ways and kind of making its presence known. And it's an extra good analogy because in the Bible, a lot of times when the, when the Holy Spirit shows up, she comes as fire. Like when Moses was hearing a call from God, he saw this bush that was on fire, but like it wasn't burning up. Like, you would expect a bush on fire to be, like, disintegrating and turning into ash, right? It was on fire, but it wasn't turning into ash. It was just, like, staying on fire. That was the presence of the Holy Spirit or the presence of God. And there are lots of other stories throughout the Bible when the Holy Spirit shows up either as wind or as fire. On Pentecost, she showed up as both. So there was like this huge wind that came through, and then the Bible tells us that little tongues of fire, little like flames, came and hovered over people's heads in sort of this really cool, mystical, magical kind of way. And then everyone started talking in different languages. Pentecost is a weird holiday. So we've got like tornado winds, we've got fire hovering above people's heads, and now everyone's talking in different languages. Why do you think that was? Why the different languages? Yeah? Mm 
Yeah, that's absolutely right. So the answer um, was the reason God made different languages to begin with was because people were trying to make a tower to heaven and God didn't want them to accomplish that task. So God made it so that they all spoke different languages so they couldn't communicate and work together and build this huge tower. That's a different story about languages. You're absolutely right. That comes from the beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis. In this case, the Holy Spirit made it so that lots of different people could speak the languages of the other people around them. Have you ever been to a really, really, really super big city? Like, not Rochester, more like New York City or Washington, D.C., someplace like that. Yeah, so you've been to, to some places where there are lots of different people speaking different languages all around, right? So Im imagine a place like that where different people are all speaking different languages and somebody's trying to preach and tell them that God loves them. Well, they would need that translated into their languages, right? That's why the Holy Spirit made it possible for them to talk all these different languages so that they could share the message of God's love with lots of different people. Now, that's one holiday. <laughs> We're gonna learn more about that in a minute. I wanna take another minute now to focus on Memorial Day because there's some overlap, believe it or not. It wasn't on purpose that Memorial Day lined up with Pentecost, I don't think. I think one is church world and one is our national world and they, they didn't really do it on purpose, but it works well that they lined them up. Because in both church and in celebration of Memorial Day, we have stories of love and sacrifice. Right? What's Memorial Day celebrate? That's right. It celebrates the soldiers that have fallen. And I think when you say soldiers, you mean all military people. Some people get technical and think that only means army. But soldiers, the way you mean it, means all military people. Right? Yeah celebrates the military people who have fallen. And so in both church world and in Memorial Day, we celebrate people like our military personnel, like Jesus, who gave up their lives so that we could have freedom, right? And so it kind of works that we can overlap them because in both cases, people gave up their lives so that we could have freedom and our job after that is to spread the message of love, right? Our job is to spread the message of love for everyone. So every year on Memorial Day, I, I like to do a certain thing that um, some of you who have been here might remember. A little caveat, in a previous congregation, um, someone got upset with me for not asking all service members to stand on Memorial Day. I do that on Veterans Day, Armed Forces Day. I try to keep Memorial Day specifically to honor those who have fallen. So what I like to do every year on Memorial Day is ask anyone who knows someone who's a service member who has fallen to stand. Does that make sense? If you know someone who lost their life in service to our country, please stand. And yes, I am standing on purpose. That goes for me too. And so I like for us to take a minute to look around and see how many people are impacted by this day every year. And to remember that each of us knows someone who gave up their life so that we could share the message of love for as many people as we can. That's the freedom we have and the responsibility to, that we have to share the message of love with as many people as we can. Let's have a seat and let's pray. God of wind and fire. Yep, God of wind and fire. Move us. Ignite us. Inspire us. To give all we have. So that others may be loved. And so that all may be free. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. This is the story of Pentecost. (laughs) Are are you reading this morning? Awesome. No, go ahead. Rock, paper, scissors? No, go ahead. (laughs) When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound, like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and Visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. And then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, I want to start this morning by telling you a story. It was almost 11 years ago. The exact date was Sunday, July 1st, 2012. So almost 11 years ago. And it was my very first day ever as a pastor. I had just finished my master's degree. I had been commissioned, which in pastor world is like the same as a college faculty member who doesn't have tenure yet. So like I was doing the job and I was given all the responsibilities but not quite through the ordination process yet. And I was shaking in my boots. So I, I, Sunday happened to fall on July 1st that year which means I had no official prep time for the service that morning because July 1st begins the appointment season. So I had been working the whole week before while moving from Rochester to Oneonta um, and newly married at that and, and trying to sort all of this out all at once. And I got to the church Sunday morning and went straight into panic mode because I realized that I didn't know whose job it was to bring the communion bread. So I called my my main contact among the laity, she was the SPRC chair, and I said, what do I do? I have no communion bread and I don't have time to go get it. And she said, honey, I'm going to be late to church this morning, but I'll, I'll take care of it for you. You'll have bread in time for communion. Sure enough, she homemade a loaf of communion bread and brought it in and, and set it on the altar while I was preaching. We had warm communion bread for communion that morning, fresh out of the oven. And after church, she, she sidled right up to me and just wrapped an arm around my shoulder and said, Grandma's got you. <laughs> <laughs> that was both the most loving thing and the most humbling thing I had ever experienced in the whole hour I had been a pastor. But something extraordinary happened in the middle of all of that. I was 
serving communion for the first time ever. I had, I had been the person standing next to the pastor and handing it out. I had been um, even someone who had been responsible for reading parts of the liturgy before. But there's this one part of the communion liturgy that we are taught is reserved for people who are duly ordained or licensed. It's called the invictus or the invitation. It's, it's the part that says, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. In the United Methodist Church, until one is licensed or ordained, we are not to say that part of the communion liturgy. And the reason for that is because there's power in those words. And intellectually, I understood that all the way through my education and training. But it wasn't until that moment when I was standing behind the table with the elements in front of me and the congregation in front of me that I felt in my cells the power of those words. I stood there before the congregation, just the usual sort of communion set up on the table, much like here, and, and I held out my hands like this, and I said, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here. And then I hesitated, because in my brain, the first thing that caught was, oh my goodness, what if God actually does that? What if God actually does that? And I, I kid you not, I, I, I was so startled by the thought and the feeling that inside my brain, but not out loud, I actually cursed. I was so startled. Oh my goodness, what if God actually does this? And I felt tingles go through my whole body, and I took a breath, and my voice was shaking, and I kept going with the liturgy. And afterwards, I just had this moment alone in my office of realizing that this is the crux of ministry. That, that receiving, calling upon God to pour out the Holy Spirit and making ourselves open to, to the receipt of that Holy Spirit and to the work and the movement of that Holy Spirit, this is what ministry is all about. Another fun fact about the United Methodist tradition. In the United Methodist tradition, we believe that some people are called to be pastors and all people are called to be ministers. We don't use those words interchangeably. They mean different things. Some people are called to the work of the clergy. All people are ministers of the gospel called to share the good news of God's love and grace and mercy with the people in their communities. And so when we are called into ministry, which all of us are when we are adopted into the family of God, when we are called into ministry, we are called to embrace and accept the Holy Spirit as she moves among us. Third fun fact, and then we'll move on. Throughout my sermon, I'll refer to the Holy Spirit as she. This is founded in biblical accuracy. The Hebrew word for spirit is ruach. In Hebrew, just like in many other languages, there are masculine nouns and feminine nouns. Um, you see this in, in modern-day Spanish, in modern-day French. This is not uncommon. Ruach is a feminine noun. So that it rubs people funny to hear me refer to the Holy Spirit as she. It's biblically supported, so that's what we'll do. So, fun facts aside... Uh, the question that I keep wrestling with and have kept wrestling with ever since that moment on July 1st, 2012, is what if? What if when I say, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, what if God actually does that? And what if we, as the people of God, open ourselves to be recipients of that Holy Spirit, not hardened off and deflecting, but open and porous and ready to be infused with that Holy Spirit. What if this happens? As I've meditated on that question over the last 11 years, the secondary question that keeps popping up for me is, why don't we? What keeps us from embracing the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Why don't we? And I think that there are three parts to that. One is a lack of certainty or a lack of clarity. For 
2,000 year, years or so now, the Christian church has debated over various topics and has not had clarity or certainty about different topics. There are some who believe some things about what the scriptures say and others who believe other things about what the scriptures say. There were discussions about who Jesus was and whether the virgin birth actually happened and all sorts of things that faithful Christians over the centuries have discussed and debated, there is admittedly a lack of clarity in our faith. And it's not because God isn't clear. It's because God moves and speaks to us in different ways through different lenses for different reasons at different times. The modes of communication can be a little um, agile, shall we say. So I think one of the things that keeps us from embracing the Holy Spirit and, and allowing ourselves to be full recipients of the Holy Spirit is just a lack of clarity or certainty about what is the Holy Spirit and, and what experiences are the Holy Spirit's work and what are not. Another reason, though, I think, is fear. And I think this is probably the bigger, stronger reason why many of us find it so hard to fully accept the power of the Holy Spirit. The scriptures tell us over and over again that God is to be feared, and quite frankly, I tend to push away from those passages, and I tend to wrestle with those passages because I don't think of God as being a mean, stern, dictatorial sort of God to fear God or else because God will punish you. That's not my theology. But the reality is God calls all of us to high standards. And God has built the world, built the universe in such a way that when we fall short of those high standards, we experience what's called natural consequences of that, both individually and as a global community. This is true. In my household, growing up, I, I won't use my own children as examples today, but in my household growing up, there were natural consequences. I've shared one just funny example here before, and I'll share it again to reiterate the point. Uh, when I turned 14, my mom decided that I was old enough to take care of my own laundry. Uh, she had spent the whole previous year teaching me the proper ways to do laundry and, you know, to sort the lights from the darks and to use cold water for this and hot water for that and here's how you take care of stains and all of, all of these things. She was very diligent in teaching me how to do it. I was well prepared. And then when I turned 14, she said, okay, it's your job now. Your laundry is your responsibility. The natural consequence of not doing your laundry when your mother tells you to do your laundry is not having clean clothes to wear to school. I learned this. I learned this the hard way one time and one time only. There are natural consequences that come with our actions, and so it is with the way that God has orchestrated the world. When we move and live and, and serve and communicate and interact in the ways that God tells us to, then we experience the blessings and benefits thereof. When we work against God's will, we experience the natural consequences thereof. So I think that all of us, to some degree or another, understand this and have a fear of the power of the Holy Spirit because we know that the Holy Spirit is going to tell us to do things that we might not want to do or to make changes that might be deeply uncomfortable. We know that the Holy Spirit is going to be like the parent telling a child to eat their broccoli. We know that the Holy Spirit is going to be like a doctor telling their patient to change their diet or to get more exercise or to change their habits. We know that the Holy Spirit is going to tell us that what's best for us and our community is stuff that makes us uncomfortable. So how do we overcome this fear? A few, a few things are necessary. One is a deep prayer life. When we are deep in our prayer life with God, we are consistently connected with God in ways that make it possible for us to put our whole trust in God's grace. 
Along with that comes a connection within sacred community. We build each other up, we support each other, we edify each other, we help each other be brave in ways that wouldn't happen if we were each isolated on our islands. And then the last way to consider is by reading the stories of those who engaged in holy boldness and drawing inspiration from their courage. So we can read those stories from the scriptures or we can read those stories of more modern day examples of that holy boldness. People like Mother Teresa or Martin Luther King Jr. would be wonderful examples. When we stay connected with God, connected with one another in our sacred community, and connected with all the saints who have exemplified this holy boldness, we find ourselves feeling a bit more courageous, a bit more ready to take the steps necessary to fully embrace the movement of the Holy Spirit. So then what would happen if we did? Well, Pentecost, the story from Acts 2, the story of Pentecost, shows us an example of what might happen if we allow the Holy Spirit to come upon us in her full power. Maybe there's some wind, maybe some fire, who knows? I, God has done that many times before, presented in forms of wind and fire. But what I think is most likely is the languages piece of the story, the part that I focused on in the children's message. I don't think that all of a sudden we will all start knowing how to speak different languages. But I do think that when we allow the Holy Spirit to permeate our being, we will learn the language we need to know to share the message of God's love with those in our community in ways that can be heard and received by all. A really sort of readily example of this I have learned, both through ministry and through motherhood, that sharing the message of God's love with a room full of mostly adults sounds very different than sharing the message of God's love with four-year-olds. Right? Sharing the message of God's love with people who are profoundly wealthy is going to sound very different than sharing the message of God's love with people who aren't sure where their next meal is coming from. Right? Sharing the message of God's love with people who have experienced devastating tragedy and trauma is going to sound very different than sharing the message of God's love with people who haven't, right? When we allow the Holy Spirit to infuse our hearts and souls to permeate our being, we learn the languages that we need to know to share the message of God's love in ways that can be heard and received by all people. By people who look different from us, people who live differently from us, people who love differently from us, people who eat differently or speak differently or worship differently from us. When we allow ourselves to be infused with the Holy Spirit, we learn to share the message of God's love with all people. A few other things might happen. Maybe we would quit clutching pearls so tightly and open our hands to receive God's blessings. Maybe we would embrace the holy miracle of who we are, who God has created each one of us to be the freedom we have in Christ, and the responsibility that comes with being adopted into the family of God. Maybe we would embrace all of these things, our identities, our freedom, our responsibility. If we were to receive the wholeness of the Holy Spirit, maybe, almost certainly, we would live in courage and love in such a way that disciples would be made and the world would be transformed. That is, after all, the mission to which all of us are called. That we allow the Holy Spirit to come upon us in such a profound and pervasive way that we learn to share God's love with every person we meet no matter what. And in so doing, that we make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Scary though that may be, wouldn't it be worth trying? 
Amen. 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 All right, I'm going to invite Simone to come join me up front for a celebration of discipleship. Come on down, my dear. While she's coming, uh, just a word of information about this. Um, for those, who, ooh, that was unexpected. Could you hold that for a moment? Thank you. <laughs> Let's try this. All right. So, at the start of the academic year, uh -huh. maybe your mom did this on purpose. Maybe she gave me a dud of a music stand. <laughs> Take the pressure off of you. Everyone's looking at me now. <laughs> All right. At the start of the school year, uh, we had some really fun conversation about confirmation class. And... Um, Simone's just about the right age to participate in a confirmation class, but we decided that since it's just a really small group of people, we were going to DIY this and not use a formal curriculum. And so I just spent the last several months leading 
the most fun and interesting confirmation class I have ever led in my career. Uh, we framed it as kind of a, a, a prolonged ask me anything. So Simone and Noel would come every Sunday with questions about anything faith-related. And they would ask me their questions, and I would do my best to stumble my way through answers, always weaving in scripture and church history. And um, I have enough of a w awareness of the confirmation curriculum to know what needed to be taught that I could weave it into my answers to their questions in ways that weren't really rote and curricular. And so then at the end of all of that, we decided that instead of having a formal traditional confirmation service, we would write our own celebration of discipleship. Since we had DIY'd the whole curriculum, we DIY'd the service too. I liken this to putting new wine into new wineskins rather than pouring new wine into old wineskins, right? So I would invite and encourage you all to join me in a celebration of discipleship as we celebrate the hard work that Simone has done all year long. Siblings in Christ, throughout the last eight months or so, two of the youth in our church have been on a spiritual journey. One of them had to work this morning. This happens. They have worked hard to develop questions, engage their curiosity, and open their minds and hearts to the teachings of our scriptures and the saints who have gone before us. They have learned much and have grown in their knowledge of God and their love for humanity. Today we celebrate and honor them and the hard work they've done. And so this morning I'd like to present Simone Gelati for a celebration of intentional discipleship. I get to start by asking her some questions. Simone, do you commit to calling out injustice and working to dismantle systems of harm encourage and hope of a better future? If so, please say, I do. I do. Do you commit to promoting acceptance of all people, regardless of labels or barriers that might affect others' judgment? If so, please say, I do. I do. One more. Do you promise to humbly seek opportunities for growth in your personal and spiritual journey? If so, please say, I do. Together, let us all speak these words of faith that Simone and Noel and I wrote together. We believe that all people are inherently worthy of love and respect. We acknowledge that not all people are universally accepted as they are, and we are committed to changing that so that all may be fully and equally embraced and celebrated within their communities. We are called to build a world that leads people to hope and promotes peace for all humanity. And now, if you'll allow me, I'll speak a word of blessing first over Simone and then over us all. God is love and loves you so deeply, nothing can separate you from the love of God, nothing, no matter what. Hold fast to this promise and know that you are not alone. You are beloved, and the world is a better place because you are a part of it. God, pour out your Holy Spirit on Simone. Permeate her spirit with your light, her heart with your love, and her mind with your truth. Fill her with hope when it seems illogical, joy that stays with her through all seasons, and courage to make the world become more like you dreamed it would be. Humble us too, O oh God, that we might follow her lead and trust her leadership as she ushers in a new era along with her peers throughout the world. Remind us, O oh God, that she and others her age are not the future of the church. They are the church, here and now, bringing love into the world in brave new ways. Bless us all and build among us a holy church, a faithful community, a people unafraid to learn, grow, and change, and eager to share your love with the world. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Members of the household of God, I commend Simone to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase her faith, confirm her hope, 
and perfect her in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you and celebrate with you in Christian love. As siblings in faith in the body of Christ and in the congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The God of all grace, who has called us by eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you, my dear. Let us celebrate the good hard work Simone's been doing this year. Yep, go ahead. There we go. And as we prepare to join in prayer with and for one another, I am so grateful for Tim being on the spot with us. We have a handful of joys and concerns that have been submitted in writing that I'll lift up. Um, In the prayer book, it is written that we please pray for the mourning families of two people who were killed at a medical clinic in Ukraine because of the war there, and to pray for 30 people who were also injured there. We're asked to pray for someone named Cindy, who's been in the hospital for several weeks with serious illnesses. Um, And I'm debating... Yeah, I know how to phrase this. Uh, Somebody wrote in, best wishes to Amara, which I think requires a bit of context. Amara's going to be getting married this summer and starting a new journey in her life. And so uh, we celebrate that. And I'll say nothing more unless you want me to. (laughs) Ellen will say plenty more. This is her last Sunday with us, yes. Uh, She'll be joining her husband-to-be's congregation. in, in the next stage of her life. All right. <laughs> uh, prayers from around the world as well. Uh, we've been asked to pray for any number of situations, both nationally and internationally, where people are subject to the violence of weather and to the violence of other humans. And so there are a number of storms and uh, different weather events that are happening throughout the world or have recently happened that are causing and have caused devastation. And we've been asked to pray for those impacted by all of those severe weather events. We're also asked to pray for those who are um, subject to gun violence in all sorts of different forms. There are so many incidences that we read in the news about ways in which Uh, Gun violence has just devastated lives and communities, and so to hold those situations in prayer. Also, prayers for safe travel. It is a holiday weekend. Lots of people are traveling. I texted my mother-in-law yesterday to see if she wanted to come for a cookout today, and she responded, nope, I'm in California. Oh, okay, good for her. Uh, So prayers for all of those who are traveling for the holiday weekend. Um, And prayers for one in our faith community. Sam is asking us to pray for him. He's really found himself in a a dark place recently. He's um, limited in the extent to which he's allowed to share his faith with the people he lives with um, and is just really wrestling with a lot of changes. So Sam, we're, we're holding you in prayer and want to make sure you know that you are loved and embraced here. Other joys or concerns to lift up at this time? One other that I'll share, um, not using last names, but most of you will know who I'm talking about. Prayers for Courtney. Um, Courtney is due to have her baby any minute now. Um, So prayers for Courtney as she enters into this new stage of her life, uh, that all would be safe and healthy. Let's take a moment then to come before God in prayer. God of grace and mercy, 
God of power and might, we praise you for all that you are and for all that you do. We praise you for the ways in which your spirit moves within and among and beyond us. And we pray this day, O oh God, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here. God, pour out your Holy Spirit that we might embrace the freedom that comes from knowing that in Christ we are forgiven. Pour out your Holy Spirit that we might embrace the responsibility that comes with being adopted into your family. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that we might be beacons of light and messengers of love and bearers of hope in our communities and throughout the world. Pour out your Holy Spirit on those who are ill or injured, that they might know your healing. Pour out your Holy Spirit on those who are grieving, that they might find that peace which passes all understanding. Pour out your Holy Spirit on those who are living in fear or in violence, that a hedge of protection might be built around them. Pour out your Holy Spirit on those living in scarcity or in poverty, that their needs may be met. Pour out your Holy Spirit on those who are subject to oppression or imprisonment, that they might know freedom. Pour out your Holy Spirit on those who are addicted, that they might find new life. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us all, that we might embrace who you have created us to be, that we might embrace the full power of our humanity and holiness, that we might embrace the freedom that you have given us through Christ, and that we might embrace the power and responsibility that come from being members of your family. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, that we might make disciples of Jesus Christ, for the transformation of the world. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. <coughs> Let's take a moment now to live out our prayers by giving back to God a portion of that which God has given to us.
Amen. Please be seated as we join our hearts together in prayer. God of wind and flame, set us on fire this morning as we celebrate the explosion of your Holy Spirit coming into the world on the day of Pentecost. <coughs> Remind us that the gift you gave that day was not just the gift to speak in different tongues, but also the gift of hearing and comprehension. May your Holy Spirit keep us attuned to the voices all around us, to those who need us to be bearers of your love and compassion. And may these gifts we give help us through your church meet those needs. In the holy name of Jesus we pray and we lift our voices together as he taught us to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, every Sunday I offer a Beyond Sunday, which is an opportunity to kind of take a little um, task home with you to further the message throughout the week. Uh, the first point I made in ways to overcome our fear of the Holy Spirit was prayer. And so that's our Beyond Sunday this week. Beyond Sunday, my hope is that each of you will add a little more time to your prayer life. If you are not someone who regularly prays, that means do so. Five minutes a day, set your alarm. If you take a daily medication, you can do it when you take your meds. If you brush your teeth every day, which I hope that you do, you can do it when you brush your teeth or whatever it is that's part of your daily rhythm. Have your morning coffee, say your prayers. These are ways that you can make sure you add daily prayer to your life. If you are someone who already does that, do a little more. Increase it by five minutes, ten minutes, whatever feels right to you. So that each of us are going a little bit deeper into our prayer life. That we might find holy boldness to receive the Holy Spirit. And with that, I invite us to stand as we're able to join in spirit song.
Amen. Amen. Please be seated to receive these words of blessing and the blessing of the music that follows. So now we leave this space of worship, and while so much of the road ahead is uncertain, the path constantly changing, we know some things that are solid and sure as the ground beneath our feet and the sky above our heads. We know God is love. We know Christ's light endures. We know the Holy Spirit is there, found in the space between all things, closer to us than our next breath, binding us each together until we meet again. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.